Hello and welcome back to day three of theCUBE's coverage, live coverage of the RSAC event here in San Francisco. We are over at Moscone West in Broadcast Alley and today I'm joined of course by my colleague Dave Vellante. Our other colleague is here, David Linthicum. But we are joined this morning for a conversation with Tom McAndrew, who's the CEO of Coal Fire. Tom, welcome. Hey, it's great to so have much. you. Hey, it's great to be here. Thank you, Dave. Love thank the shirt, by the way. Oh, thank you. Yeah, try to let, let the ponies run today. It's, so. You know, it's the time of season. We have the Kentucky Derby, we got the Preakness coming up. Bell Oh. <laughs> exactly, yeah, no, I appreciate it. Yeah, it's great. You know, the timing of having you on, we were just talking before, before we went live, is perfect because what Coal Fire does is kind of a different focus area than some of the conversations that we've been having here at RSAC the last couple of days. We've had lots of conversations about AI and AI security and all that sort of thing, but Coal Fire's focus is slightly different. So why don't you tell us a little bit about you know, where you're focusing? Sure, absolutely. So for those that aren't aware, Coal Fire's, uh, we're the largest independent cybersecurity company and we really do help out with two problems. One are compliance and regulations, which is probably what we're very known for. So most of the world's largest enterprise customers come to us for cyber certifications, whether it's high trust, FedRAMP, ISO, SOC, you know, all the other 60 plus emerging regulations that people have to figure out uh, and how to certify their products. And the second is actually dealing with some of the cybersecurity programs. So we have one of the largest penetration testing teams in the world, and then we're doing a lot of building for large organizations that they're shifting to cloud. So that's really the area that we focus in on that, and uh, primarily on larger enterprise customers. So like you said, I'm spending a lot of time with boards and executives that are trying to grapple with cloud migration, Gen AI, and some of the new SEC disclosure laws to saying what should we be doing at the executive level as we think of cybersecurity. So the, the market is, let's call it roughly 200 billion. Sure. Half of that is services. Yes. So you play in a hundred billion dollar TAM today. And is that, is that a fair way to think about your total available market? Uh, yeah, I think so. I mean, I think one thing that's happened is, you know, all services, I mean, all services companies usually start as pure service, get some tech enablement, get some product and platform. So as we looked at it, you know, we are a tech enabled service. We've got a product that is Compliance Essentials, which is our, our massive platform, which we have over 6,000 different users across both our pen testing platform and, and, and compliance platform. So, um, you know, we're not fully managed services on everything, but you're basically seeing that you can't scale out with just people and throwing bodies. I've always told people, you. You can't just be Word documents, Excel sheets. So you've got to have some technology, and particularly as things are scaling out, the number of regulations, the number of security requirements. Um, I think the attack surface grew about 33% last year, and so you cannot keep. You know, budgets are not growing 30%, people are not growing 30%. So you've got to get the tech. But one of the big pivots from last year, and you see this here at RSA, right? we walk the streets and you see all these vendors. There's definitely a pivot to saying, you know, CISOs don't need another piece of technology, right? They need to simplify what they have and the people component is important. So that combination of people and product is super important in really any cybersecurity company. Yeah, you know, I think it's interesting, the, the board focus, and I, what I think most people don't realize is that we have a board problem. And I know you're very aware of this, but you know, the Wall Street Journal published late last year some stats showing that only 2.3% of directors of boards of the S&P 500 companies have any kind of cybersecurity experience. Yes. So we're in a situation where boards are making important decisions about risk mitigation and protecting the company, and they don't really have any expertise at all in this area. So it seems to me that you're delivering a service at a pretty timely juncture for us. Absolutely, so I think two parts, right? Boards are really good at risk management, and that's what they do. So they don't necessarily have to have the deep cyber expertise, but one of the challenges is cyber is very, can be very confusing and can be very relevant. So in many companies, whether it's down, you know, ransomware attacks are up 23% this year, right. everybody is worried. So it's gone from like a board level topic to what people need to know. In fact, as of this year, over 50% of the enterprise boards are having quarterly or more frequently reporting on cybersecurity. Yeah. So it definitely is becoming a board topic, but so what, right? Um, boards are, like we say, boards are nose in, hands out, so they're not in the day-to-day -day management of things. Right. So what does that mean and what does good governance look like? It's a big question and, and two big changes within the last year that have changed it, right? The emergence of Gen AI. I'm not talking to any, you know, 
we're all hearing about in the news. Everyone's doing some Gen AI platform. Uh, and the second is the new SEC re report, uh, reporting regulations which require uh, companies now to disclose what they are doing for cybersecurity, who's responsible and what their expertise is. Right. So those two things have changed uh, right now and that are causing a lot of um, angst and questions at the board and executive level. So what specifically are these updated SEC's regulations? Uh, what do I have to do to comply? How are you helping people comply? Sure, so if you're a public company, you have to disclose in your 10K, how are you addressing cybersecurity? And what most of them kind of have a generic, you know, we've got a CISO, they report here, we invest in products, and those sorts of things. Copy so, paste. Yeah, so if yeah. you look at what happened and starting in January, people started publishing those. So it wasn't really a super big thing, people did it. The challenge though now is when breaches are happening, people, or you have a ransomware attack, which is happening every month. Now public folks are saying, okay, well why did that happen? And if you had good cybersecurity, what was the root cause? So now you're kind of stuck in saying, well, were you negligent that you didn't really disclose that you didn't invest in the right tools and products or did you not have the right people? So that's what's kind of causing the problem is if you don't disclose enough, uh, people will think that you may be misleading investors in materiality, right. but if you do just disclose too much, now you're causing some challenges. So right. those are the two problems that there really are no good answers today, and you know, we're, we're, we're in the first year. So the people that are going through these breaches are really having a struggle, um, and there's a lot of angst at the board. So th the lesson learned, I think, for folks is um, being very careful about what's in that 10K in public statement, mm -hmm. and for those of us that are private, that aren't, uh, they don't have to deal with the SEC laws, uh, Department of Homeland Security has a draft notice too that would require similar reporting on breaches for all companies. So that is a new trend that uh, you know once you have to proactively say what you're doing, that's a challenge. Just a follow up, when you say they have to be careful about what they put in their 10K, meaning they have to be detailed enough, or are you saying they, sh they, they should not overpromise? Yeah, it's trying to find the Goldilocks zone, right? <laughs> of, uh, I mean, you don't want to overpromise and, uh, and under deliver, but you also don't want to mislead investors. And that's the challenge. If you look at some of these, and, and some of them have reported, hey, we have a breach, we haven't determined that it's going to be material. Yeah. And if then later it's a $100 million deal, or you want to put a massive lawsuit, or the government starts going after you, people will say, why did you not determine that that was a material thing when it was disclosed? You know, Microsoft is excoriated by the U.S. government for deficient security. If Microsoft can't get it right, how is you know, anybody going to get it right? Yeah, it's, uh, I mean, and that is part for the boards, right? I mean, most organizations are not built to fight nation state attacks, and even though you are, what, what's going to happen? I mean, yeah. a good example with ransomware, right, is if, if you're a, as a person, like if my, if my, if my family uh, was taken hostage and something would happen, I reached out to the government, they'd say don't pay, but they would help, help me with that recovery. In the digital world, that doesn't happen. You have a ransomware attack, you go to the government, you say, how do we deal with it? They say, don't pay, <laughs> but we don't help, right? By push the data to us. And so there's a couple exceptions for some major organizations, but you know, Satya Nadella just in their most recent report said, you know, cybersecurity is the number one priority for Microsoft. And you know, all the news has been Gen AI, all that growth, and so uh, I think that's that lesson learned is you've, you've got to have it, and for folks like, I mean, any of these larger organizations, it is a challenging environment. Like what, what should Microsoft do, what should DHS do, and then what do normal folks do that are right. consumers of this? Right. Um, our national security policy is to take the work away from smaller organizations and push the burden on the larger providers. So what happens when those larger providers fail, that's the challenge that we're trying to work with and, today. And you know, it's easy to pick on the three trillion dollar market cap company, yeah. but the analogy I use is I live in an old house and there's so many coats of paint on my barn. Yeah. Right? And so that's the problem with, you know, Microsoft has, they were founded you know, many decades decades ago, and so it's not an easy problem to solve. How do you handle that in terms of what coal fire can do with a, an organization that has such a complex infrastructure with so much legacy, so many potential holes? How yeah. do you attack that problem? Yeah, I mean, we've been working with so many different larger organizations um, as they're dealing with these sorts of uh, challenges and how to deal with it. So one of it is there's a lot of solutions that are out there. Um, what people are seeing is um, how do you hodgepodge or gather all those sorts of areas? So it's, it's usually not a technical solution, it's usually how do you bring everything Process. together, right? Mm -hmm. it's, not, it's not that there's a tool that's missing, but would you find a cascade of kind of failure? So what these larger organizations are saying, hey, let's start 
consolidating our vendors. So that's been definitely one thing that we see happening. And so rather than getting best of breed, you're looking really kind of for best of suite or group of folks. And the second card is kind of the contracting, the vendor. Like a lot of people have put this massive cloud spend. I mean, we work a lot with AWS. Um, they have a lot of people that have committed a lot of funding and have it, but they don't know how to pick and, pick and navigate through all the different AWS solutions that can ha handle all these areas. So those are the things that we can really help out with. Is, yeah, with Amazon, for example, we've got a private offering where you can get any of our services through Amazon uh, on one. Um, the ISVs, there's over, I think, 30,000 ISVs that um, Amazon has that all have security and compliance. Yeah. Rather than 30,000 people solve their own solution, how do we work with Amazon on it? And the third one, which is most interesting, is everyone, that's great, but where do I get the funding? Um, a lot of these larger cloud providers can help offset some of the funding. And so, you know, talking to CISO saying, we got a solution, great, I'm, I'm one of a bajillion vendors that do that. But when you right. say, hey, by the way, I can save you half a million dollars and implement something, and it's already your committed spend, all of a sudden that becomes is much more interested you to get what their they're attention. doing. So. Yeah, absolutely. You know, the consolidation, though, that's such an interesting, this is not the first time we've heard this uh, here these days. But this, <laughs> is, this is actually yeah. kind of the opposite of what our research has shown. And, yeah. and we went into this topic, we went into this conversation, kind of, you know, you, when you do some research, you make some assumptions. And one of the assumptions that we made was that people would be moving more to, you know, one solution or a platform solution right. or whatever. And, and I know that you you have this research committed to your brains. Yeah, so 51% so of the customers who, so we had 321 uh, folks in the survey, half of them were attending RSA, 51% said we're actually expanding the number of tools and vendors that we have. Yeah. And so, and the, the big chunk would stay the same, maybe about 9% were able to consolidate. Now, what does that say to me? First of all, it says practitioners are having trouble right, right. Right. Yeah. consolidating. They can never get rid of stuff. The second thing, we talked to Jay Chaudhry last night from yeah. Zscaler. He said, we're not seeing that in our base. Yeah. Virtually every customer we have, we consolidate. Yeah. I think George Kurtz from CrowdStrike would probably say the same thing. You're saying the same thing. It's hard though, because you're not 100% market share, right, neither right. Zscaler or CrowdStrike. Most customers are having trouble getting rid of stuff. Yeah. Right. And so, interesting that you see that data, but that means it's Big opportunities. Ahead. Well, I see a yeah. potential. You know, I think why both of these could make sense, right? It probably is the market, right? So, if you are a cloud-enabled, cloud-first uh, technology company, you are massively doing some consolidation, right? Yeah. If you are an on-prem historic and you're doing cloud, you have the worst of both worlds yeah. now. You got to maintain your old infrastructure and move to your new. So he said, so absolutely, so some people are adding a whole lot more because they're managing on-prem and off, they're managing different sorts of tools, um, or they're doing that migration and a lift and shift. But those that are a little bit more, you know, and those that can scale, can move at pace, they, I mean, you cannot, you know, that old saying of if you want to go fast, go alone, if you want to go further, you know, go, go with others. Um, speed matters now, and so sometimes getting, you know, maybe not the best product or the top tier product, but a good enough product that is configured right is way better than, I think, 20 or 30% of the products we see are shelfware. It, this is interesting, yeah. because I would agree with what you're saying, yeah. Tom, because, but I think most practitioners in the SecOps world believe that they need to go to the new shiny toy and get best to breed. Yeah. And I, I think what you said makes a lot more sense. If, if you could, that, okay, good enough, maybe not good enough, but, but having a framework that brings together those good enough pieces and you get the processes and the people right, that actually is ideal. Yeah, I mean, I yeah. see it. I mean, as CEO, I see it all the time, right? My people come to me and say, hey Tom, we need this, we need this solution, it'll make our life better. And then how many times we integrate it a year later, doesn't happen, or those people leave and it doesn't happen. It's usually you have to change the processes first before you implement the technology, and all this tech without it, without the process change, doesn't matter. So the companies that are innovating, and that's where you see innovation, all this stuff. I mean, you know, Gen AI is a big area, right? Like it's not a tool issue, it's not a, you know, what are you buying? It's, well, how do you one, make the right investment, and then how do you change the process? And maybe that's one difference is this year, you know, the VC markets and the smaller organizations have been absolutely slammed over the last year, right? Yeah. Last year you saw all these companies focus on profitability and efficiency. That means less features, less focus in their products, and they're, they're less robust, and so yeah. that's an area that the roadmaps have been slipping, and so yeah. people, are, people are seeing less from their vendors and putting more pressure. Yeah. yeah, this has definitely been the year of do more with less. Exactly, <laughs> right? yeah, and we're all, we're all doing it, you know, yeah. so do more with less, but if you're buying more products and services, that's kind of a recipe for disaster in the long yeah. run. 
Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Did you? I know you all did some research uh, that you published at the end of 2023. It's called your Secure Realities Compliance Report. Any interesting tidbits to come out of that? Anything that surprised you? Yeah. I mean, I think a couple. I mean, we, you know, we've done over 50,000, you know, uh, or 11,000 penetration tests, 50,000 different endpoints that we look at. So there's a lot of data, and also on the compliance side of things. So I think two parts in our world. There's always been, some folks have said there's kind of security and compliance are different worlds. You know, and I'd see this as a security practitioner, it's like compliance is the minimum, security is really what you have to do. But when you start going to the board, it's about negligence and best practice and it's hard to talk about that. So a good example, how do you know what, what you're doing in your penetration program is, is good enough? That when you have an issue and someone looks at what you've spent and how you've done, what those issues are. And so, um, both the, the compliance practitioners need to be aware of what's going on in security, and security needs to know what's compliance. So what's going on in compliance? Right, you know, every regulation is happening out there on the world. I mean, I, there's one organization I dealt with, they have 15 people full time that just scour the world on changes and regulations. Right, 15 full-time people that said, wow. this is a new change in Germany, this is a change in Italy, yeah. this is what's going on in NIST, this is what's going on here. So the prolifer proliferation of regulations, and just something like Gen AI, for example, there's two major frameworks. There's a NIST um, risk management framework and ISO. A lot of people aren't even aware of that. And so if they're implementing Gen AI and doing it, they're, make, they're, they're going to be stuck with a year from now, we haven't thought about that security, we haven't thought about this. And so the larger organizations are trying to get ahead of that uh, in what they're doing, but the smaller folks are doing it. So it is frustrating because we always try to say, you know, bake security in, don't sprinkle it on top. And when all these new emerging areas like Gen AI, we're starting to see those same things. So the, the, the guidance is if you're a security practitioner, you need to at least have some familiarity of the regulations and what's going on. Some familiarity of what the US is doing, international's doing, SEC, DHS, uh, because whether you're public or private or not, those are the best practices. And if you're public or private, or if you're a public company, you better be really looking at these dynamics and being very careful about what, how you're disclosing your cybersecurity, uh, because when you have the incident, we all have incidents, uh, people are going to look at what you said, and that didn't exist before. I, I know we're over time, but are you pen testing differently for Gen AI? Uh, absolutely, so there's a couple of unique things for Gen AI, which is, um, I mean, there's a brand new, e, you know, if you look at the EU Act, that, um, they have some new regulations into it, so, you know, perfect example. Uh, let's say part of it says, hey, um, you know, there's been more images created by Gen AI in the last year than all of photography before. So you're creating that. So something simple of, okay, we want to make sure that the pictures you and I are looking at, you know, are watermarked or tagged, right? So if that ends up something you have happening, well as hackers, we're thinking about, okay, well how, how do you do that so we can generate things that subvert that watermark? So everyone is trying to think how to build this, but my point is you got to think like the hackers of, okay, yeah. we're going to try to figure out how to subvert what you're doing, how to use that for malicious areas, and that's an area that the Gen A programs are thinking, oh, we're not thinking about, um, we're building the rules, but you're not thinking about how easy it is to subvert those rules. Mm. So absolutely. Cool. Wow. Well, Tom McAndrews, CEO of Coal Fire, thank you so much for joining us today and, and uh, for our viewing audience. Keep it right here on theCUBE as we cover all things coming out of RSAC here in San Francisco. And you want to keep it on theCUBE. <laughs>